the next section is the rural poor and the rural poor uh, we, we try and identify villages, uh, perhaps even small towns uh, and children from these small towns. Pelling is an example of a small town uh, who are poor and uh, uh, who we think should be brought into the law schools, uh, particularly if they have an aptitude for the study of law. Uh, then we have a section on disabilities, so we try and identify candidates with disabilities. So we've uh, identified a school in Hyderabad that uh, primarily caters to children with visual impairment or blind children. Uh, and we're training about uh, 12 students from there now, both from class 11 and class 12. Uh, we also try and identify students from vernacular medium schools, uh, but that is a big challenge for us because vernacular medium uh, is the toughest branch of students to teach. Um, given that their proficiency in English is very low, uh, we need much more time with them. And uh, this year we have students from the Sundarbans and from the Howrah district in West Bengal. Uh, we're training them, but uh, we don't think it's sufficient time, one year is sufficient time. So next year onwards, uh, if we take vernacular medium students, it's going to be a training for at least two or three years. Um, so in terms of uh, the, the various uh, aspects of this project in terms of its day-to-day -day implementation, um, I've already mentioned what the idea is, what the underlying aim is. Uh, in terms of its day-to-day -day implementation, it's very simple. The, the concept is very, very simple. We identify, you know, we sensitize communities, underprivileged, underrepresented communities about law as a potential career option. And this is a huge challenge for us because there are, like I said, cultural perception issues with the study of law with the lawyer, with the profession of law, people don't see, you know, it's not an easy sell, it's not as easy as uh, convincing parents that they need to send their kids to a good engineering or a medical school. I think uh, engineering and medicine, they don't need any convincing at all. They want their kids to do that because engineers and doctors are seen as good people. Uh, with law, it's, it's uh, one is that uh, it's much more difficult to convince them and two is that uh, people also think that it doesn't pay well enough that the lawyer is someone that may or may not have a brief, that may earn very little money going to a court, that has to work long hours. Uh, and so we have to change all of that. We have to demonstrate to them that, look, uh, you know, if, you, if, if your son or daughter makes it to the top law schools, then you don't need to worry about financial stability. They make as much money as uh, possibly a good MBA graduate from the IIMs or the top engineering graduates would make. Uh, in fact, more than them. Uh, because the going salaries now are uh, with the top law firms are uh, at least 80,000 upwards uh, per month. Uh, and then we also have to tell them that law is uh, a very diverse profession. It uh, presents diverse career opportunities. Uh, they can decide to litigate. They can decide to go to a law firm. They can decide to work with an NGO. They can decide to work in an international organization. They can decide to do research or teach. Um, social activism, you know, so uh, the, the range of options that law presents is something that the other disciplines do not offer. So you don't get the same range in engineering, you don't get it in medicine, you don't get it anywhere else. Um, so, and if not for anything else, even if you don't want to be actively involved with the legal profession, the skill sets that uh, you get uh, and the skill sets being the skill to advocate on behalf of any cause, the skill to persuade, the skill to write cogently, coherently, and to argue convincingly. These are skills that would help you in any aspect of life, whichever ones you choose. So the main obstacle that we face with, uh, with, with the IDEA program, when we set about trying to identify communities and select scholars, is, is, a, is a cultural problem. It's a cultural problem associated with uh, the perception of law and the fact that it's not perceived to be a good and viable career option. And we have to change that. And we change that by speaking to the students, by speaking to the teachers, by speaking to their parents. And uh, I think we also, uh, you know, the other attraction is once, uh, so, so, so to give you a small example, you know, when we started with the, with the government high school in Pelling, uh, it was a class of uh, about 100 students and uh, we asked them how many wanted to do law and I saw only one hand uh, that was up. Uh, just one student had heard about the law and wanted to do law. Uh, none of the others wanted it. They hadn't heard of it and uh, we asked them their career options and uh, some of them wanted to do engineering. One of them even wanted to be a bus driver. 
and uh, we then spoke to them about the law we spoke about uh, what options the law gives uh, as a in terms of a career uh, what life in law school is all about and uh, we found that uh, after the talk which you know it was a talk of about 30 to 45 minutes a lot of students suddenly wanted to decided that they want to do law and we realized that the major bottleneck that we face uh, in terms of having students from these communities take up law is the fact that they are just not aware and we need to create that awareness uh, and we need to incentivize more people from these communities to start thinking seriously about a legal career uh, because they are the voices of that community and the best profession for them uh, which can train them in effectively being that voice and in advocating the cause of that community is really the law. Uh, of course, we try and ensure when we pick these students that we're not forcing them into something that they don't want. We explain the various pros and cons of law school, of the legal profession, uh, of what they're missing out on otherwise. We tell them about the long hours, etc. Uh, and then leave the choice up to them if they're interested then uh, and, and of course they have to take the test, they have to take an aptitude test that tests them on their logical reasoning skills, their analytical abilities and only if they score high in that test do we bring them in as part of our program. We call them idea scholars and then we offer them a scholarship which enta entitles them to free training uh, for the CLAT exam, free books, free materials, free newspapers, free magazines. Uh, we give them newspapers and current affairs magazines because current affairs is a large component of the CLAT exam and uh, they have to be very well aware of what's going on around them. We also think it's useful uh, if they're setting about to study the law to be aware of the politics, the economics and the society around them uh, in terms of uh, what is happening currently. Um, <clears throat> and the idea is to build this really into a mass movement. I mean, we. We, we, st we are starting out very small. Right now we have uh, about one, two, three, four, about five to six states that are involved in this program. We have the national law schools at these five to six states. Uh, we started in, uh, with the National University of Juridical Sciences and we covered West Bengal and the Northeast. Then the National Law School in Bangalore covered Bangalore. The uh, Nalsar, which is a national law school in Hyderabad, covered Hyderabad. Uh, the uh, Newals, which is a law school in Cochin, covered Kerala. Uh, NLU in Jodhpur covered Rajasthan and uh, a national law school in Gujarat has covered Gujarat. Uh, but we intend to expand uh, and out of all these schools that we've so far gone to, we've selected about uh, 40 to 50 students who are now undergoing training. Now not all of them are going to write CLAT. Uh, we hope that most of them will. Some of them may not remain as part of the program. In fact, we have to actively drop people from our program if they didn't show enough interest or they didn't turn up for enough classes or we saw that the parents were creating problems because some parents still don't appreciate the value of this and uh, these parents are still trying, uh, uh, you know, since they're not able to understand the value of this, they're dissuading their children from spending time studying for CLAT. Uh, they would rather have them spend that time studying for their class 12 exams or studying for uh, engineering or medical entrance exam. In fact, some of our brightest students from Pelling, uh, we didn't pick them uh, uh, for the IDEA program. We didn't make them IDEA scholars. Uh, although they were the brightest because their parents were very adamant that uh, uh, that they should study for engineering and their medical entrances. Uh, and they were more keen that they qualify there, although the children themselves wanted to do law. Uh, but, that, but those are the obstacles that we face. We have to handle them. We can't override parental wishes. We can't override uh, uh, the dynamics, the political and socioeconomic dynamics of the communities and of the schools uh, that these children come from. Um, so in terms of, uh, uh, so, so really uh, the main obstacles, as I mentioned earlier, one was the cultural obstacle with, and, 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 the, and the lack of awareness about law. Um, then of course the next obstacle is the fact that although some of these children are very, very bright and their analytical abilities uh, are on par, if not better, than most of the brighter students from the urban areas, uh, the fact remains that uh, for a lot of them, English is a problem because the level of English that is imparted to them uh, in small towns, in villages, um, is not of a very high standard. Um, and so, and, and given that CLAT, CLAT's questions are framed in such a way that it requires a fairly high degree of proficiency in English, one of our biggest bottlenecks is 
to bring them on par with the other urban students in terms of their grasp of English. Because unless they are fairly proficient in English, uh, all the questions of CLAT, not just the English section, but even the legal reasoning and logical reasoning, would be difficult for them to comprehend. And even if they comprehend it, they would do the question much slower than the others, which would then impact them negatively uh, because they don't finish the paper in time. And so the English training part of of idea is, is one of the most intensive parts and one thing that we wish to focus on uh, in the years to come. And uh, we really have to look at innovative and clever ways of trying to bridge the gap and bring them on par, uh, you know, trying to get them to start thinking in English very, very rapidly. This problem is, of course, compounded when we pick vernacular medium students for whom English is an even bigger problem. And then uh, we have to start their training program gradually in their vernacular. We train them in logical reasoning, legal reasoning, etc., in the vernacular first, and then gradually ease them into English. Uh, and also we have a very, very intensive English training program for them uh, to, to get them up to speed very quickly and to get them to think in English very, very quickly. Uh, so these are some of the challenges. In a, and, and the third level of challenge is what if they make it, right? The law school environments are not the best environments right now for marginalized sections. Uh, in fact, if you visit any of the top law schools, uh, you'd find that all of them suffer from a serious diversity problem. Uh, a majority of the children are, uh, are from the urban elite. Uh, surveys conducted at all the major law schools demonstrated that out of a class of uh, 80 or 100, just one of them uh, happens to be from a rural area uh, or happens to be a vernacular medium student. Uh, all the others are from urban areas or small towns. Um, their income levels are quite high. Um, they are certainly middle class or upper middle class. Uh, a large portion of them are related to the legal profession in some way, or they're the children of bureaucrats or IPS officers, defense services. 80%, uh, almost 80% of them undergo CLAT training at private institutions, at coaching centers that are private. Uh, and these are coaching centers uh, that charge, you know, 10 to 20,000 rupees a year for training. Uh, so these are various bottlenecks that the children from underprivileged backgrounds face. So even if they're aware of the law, they want to study for these exams, they want to come in, there's a huge financial barrier towards joining these training centers, uh, which is why through this program we want to offer them free training. And we're very lucky because we have tied up with IMS, which is a... Uh, commercial service provider, it's one of the leaders in CLAT coaching and MBA coaching as well. And they have a CSR cell and, and they very kindly agreed to collaborate with us on this to offer all our scholars free training, free materials. Uh, they will register them as uh, their own and, uh, and impart materials and training and online assistance and, and whatever it takes uh, so that they can be fully prepared for the CLAT exam which they have to take in May 2011. Uh, the CLAT exam is always in the month of May. Uh, of course, we can't just rely on the training centers for everything uh, because, again, most of the children are weak in English and training centers are catering to mainly the urban, uh, you know, children that are in the urban schools, so their English is already good. So we have to have additional programs uh, of training in English. Uh, we also need to speak to parents more constantly. We need to mentor these kids to keep their motivation up because a lot of them may not be from areas that are close to us. Uh, so we need to keep a regular tab and uh, we can't just let it, we can't just bring them in and then hand them over to the training centers and expect them to do everything. Uh, it doesn't work that way.